Hi folks, thank you for joining us. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds or a minute. Excellent, excellent. Hello, everyone. Welcome, bienvenue, guten tag, konnichiwa, and hi tai, as we say in Okinawa. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank everyone who has worked to make this session possible, especially our co-host, the Permanent Mission of Japan to the United Nations, along with the Science Summit organizers and team members at OIST, at the Japan Times, and at Sustainable Japan by the Japan Times. My name is Heather Young, and I'm the very proud Vice President of Communications and Public Relations at OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. And I'm also the co-chair of the Science Summit in Japan. Today, we are very, very fortunate to have with us Dr. Peter Gruss in conversation with Tomoko Otake. The topic of their discussion is the importance of investing in research excellence for the benefit of humanity. So we have a big, important topic in front of us tonight. Dr. Gruss is the president and CEO of OIST. He is an internationally renowned researcher in gene regulation and embryonic development, who previously served as the president of the Max Planck Society in Germany. Otake-san is a senior writer at the Japan Times focused on health, medical, and social issues. A native of Nara, Nara Prefecture, Japan's ancient capital, she has a BA from the Osaka University of Foreign Studies, now Osaka University, and an MA in journalism from the University of Montana. From Montana to Majorca to Mumbai to Miyakojima, from whatever time you're joining us, I know you will enjoy listening in on this conversation, and I hope you will learn a little and be inspired too. Otake-san, the floor is yours. Thank you, Heather. Good morning to everyone participating from New York and good evening to those of you in Japan. My name is Tomoko Otake and I cover mostly health and science stories for the Japan Times, a Tokyo-based English language news outlet that is in its 125th year. Over the next 20, uh, 50 minutes or so today, I hope to explore the importance of science in our society, why it's crucial that we invest in research for the long term particularly in basic science, and how we should reform the process of funding research here in Japan and elsewhere in the world to get the most out of investment and prove the quality of life for people on our planet. Dr. Gruss, we have a lot to cover today, but I've been looking forward to speaking with you in your capacity as a foremost biologist and science admin research administrator and I hope that in our time together today, we can also take up a few questions from viewers before wrapping up the session. Let's start uh, by addressing the historic challenge we are facing at the moment, COVID-19. Over the past two and a half years, our lives have been completely upended by this pandemic. And the virus is still here, despite many countries adopting a policy of living with the coronavirus. According to the World Health Organization, there have been over 600 million confirmed cases COVID-19 so far, and more than 6.4 million people have been confirmed to have died from the disease. At the same time, however, we've been able to see how quickly scientists can rally. In just one year after the pandemic set in, several vaccines have been developed. Now, uh, two thirds of the world's population has received at least one dose of a vaccine, and that has helped prevent an even more catastrophic outcome. Dr. Gruz, is it correct to say that this outcome has not been possible without decades of basic research? Indeed, this is very correct. And depending on where you put the starting point, uh, I think the originator of the discovery of mRNA 
which is the molecule that encodes protein was Sidney Brenner. And Sidney Brenner happens to be the scientific father of OIST. So Sydney in 1961 discovered mRNA. So it's more than 60 years of intensive research that has led to this with steps in between, like in the middle of the 90s, people have tried to utilize the mRNA as a means to uh, code for anti-cancer proteins. We needed to uh, change the RNA to make it stable, put it into a, a lipid bubble, and then uh, use it. So now the interesting issue here is, uh, it was 60 years, uh, and if I look at the generation of the vaccine, as you said, uh, which is unheard of in the history of vaccines, uh, it took only one year. The next best uh, was a uh, Ebola virus, it took five years. So now when I look at uh, what were the, what was the environment, what was the prerequisite to generate this vaccine, we come up with an interesting observation because this new route using an RNA as a, a stimulus to make proteins in a cell of our body has been used by two startup companies. BioNTech and Moderna. This is an interesting observation because all other companies, well-known Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, they used the more traditional route. So we learned something from that. What we learn is that the major companies were not innovative enough, were relying on young companies dynamic with the creativity. And hence, if we now call the vaccine that is sold in the world the Pfizer vaccine, which this is obviously wrong because Pfizer has utilized BioNTech methods and produce it and distribute it in the world. So I think from a scientific standpoint, uh, we have to give credit uh, where credit is due and the credit is due to BioNTech and Moderna. Um, and I think uh, this demonstrates uh, what it takes in modern uh, research that sometimes it is 60 years until we can utilize the research over decades and do something that is of value to our society. That's very interesting. So we have like 60 years of history and two very young startups utilizing that technology. Now, uh, keeping within the context of the pandemic, why is it, do you think, uh, some countries have been more successful in mobilizing the power of scientific research than others? For example, Japan is the world's la third largest economy, but we have yet to produce our own COVID-19 vaccine or single uh, domestically developed uh, COVID drug on the market. As a biologist, a scientist, an administrator at OIST, which is a top school for science, where do you think things have, might have gone, gone wrong? Well, um, I, I think uh, one, one couldn't call it gone wrong. One, what one should call uh, it is what has been missing and what has not been developed. And here I'm afraid to say that uh, the Japanese uh, infrastructure for technology transfer that then would uh, use IP, intellectual property that is generated in universities or any uh, research institution uh, in order to be transferred into a product that is generated through a startup company is very poorly developed. Mm. Uh, within Japan, we have many deficits here. Uh, there is not a, a proper technology transfer mechanism uh, in most universities. There is too little venture capital, and I can give you a number, only 3% uh, 
of the venture capital that is available in the United States is available for Japanese startups. So it doesn't matter that Japan is the third largest economy. What matters is the dynamics. Mm -hmm. Japan has lost the innovative capacity. Japan has to invest more in startups, uh, more in high tech in order to generate what in this world of startups is called unicorns. Uh, that means companies like now BioNTech or Moderna that are worth more than 1 billion US dollar. So from this point of view, the, the link between university and the final uh, production uh, in, a, in a startup company is not working well. Um, what it also shows uh, that uh, the interaction between uh, established pharma companies, for example, and universities hasn't been working too well because otherwise they would have come up with something like this. So uh, from my point of view, the greatest deficit is indeed uh, the technology transfer interface. I see, I see. That's an interesting point. Although uh, Japan has um, thought about, I think, uh, technology transfer and talked about it, uh, it hasn't really had a proper mechanism. Um, what about the funding in the research institutions that are supposed to be the seeds, produce the seeds of these um, inventions? Well, I'm awful, awfully sorry to continue with, with the bad <laughs> message because I'm, I'm living in Japan. I like to live in Japan. It's a wonderful country, but it does have deficits. And uh, what uh, has happened in Japan was that the funding is, uh, that is available for basic research is really has stagnated for more than 15 years. So what needs to be uh, realized, uh, I'd say by the government in particular also, by the Minister of Finance is that investment in science is not a subsidy, it's not a nice to have. Uh, I think the world agrees that investment in science is the prerequisite mm. to prepare our minds and our societies for the challenges of the future. And again, let me come, go back to the RNA uh, vaccination because it shows without a proper knowledge and know-how in this field, you couldn't do it. So in Japan, apparently no one was working properly on mRNA and hence it couldn't be developed as a product. So having said this, one would have to, uh, one, one would need to understand then uh, first, uh, how is the funding structure and what are the pros and cons of different funding structures? Uh, now in Japan, uh, we have mostly what I call a low trust funding. A low trust funding is like competitive grant funding. And uh, studies have shown that if you mostly fund research through competitive grant funding, it's a very inefficient way to fund research because uh, cutting edge research, highly risky research, research uh, that is moving into new areas, interdisciplinary research is mostly not being funded through the uh, um, uh, low trust funding or through the competitive grant funding because if you want to make money for yourself and the laboratory, you have to then apply to a funding agency. The funding agency is asking your peers and your peers will not give you the grant uh, that uh, is uh, departing from the main route of science. Hence, a good research funding system needs what I call the high trust funding or in other countries, it's called block funding. Uh, so you need a defined period of time where you give the money to the best minds and let them roam freely in their research field 
And after, let's say, five years, you can then look back and see what is happening uh, and what the results have been in order to possibly adjust the funding upwards, downwards, or keep it steady. This has been shown to be the most efficient way to generate breakthrough innovations, to generate breakthrough data. And let's remind ourselves, everything that is new comes from fundamental research or else it wouldn't be new. So we have to remember <laughs> that first you have to establish a basis. And once you have this basis, then you can think about uh, technology. So science and technology, if applied appropriately, can have an enormous effect uh, in order to produce solutions for our society or produce completely new directions. Let, 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 let us uh, think of, of uh, what's called uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who is literally the um, originator of the internet. And all he wanted to do is have two institutions from CERN talk to each other. And I mean, he wouldn't have thought what this would, um, would do for our societies. It had one of the greatest impacts in the communication of large masses in our history. So uh, bottom line is give a good balance of high trust funding and low trust funding uh, and specifically for Japan, give more because Japan is uh, otherwise not competitive anymore. I see. So uh, just coming back to the uh, definition of uh, high trust and low trust uh, funding, this is a very basic question, but just for myself. So you call it high trust or low trust because, because um, the government- well, a gov Yes, a government uh, has of course a means uh, to direct the research results by channeling money. And this is what I call low trust, because uh, if the money is channeled, say, into a defined area, obviously the government has to presume that this area will yield results. But we know in science, sometimes the actual solutions come from completely different angles. Oh. So the low trust means you define a research line for five years or 10 years, while the high trust means we give our scientists the money for five years and let them think about the most creative work they can deliver. And out of this work, usually the breakthroughs come. And uh, I, I have actually also a hypothesis for myself. I find that the mainstream research that is funded through low trust is mostly uh, resulting in incremental innovation. Mm. While the high trust can yield what I call breakthrough innovation, open completely new doors and uh, allow then people to uh, think of utilizing this uh, new, this opening in order to generate a complete different line of research or products like the RNA vaccination. I see. So um, when you say uh, we need a good balance of high trust and good, you know, low trust um, funding, what is the best balance, would you say? And how does um, Japan? Um, yes. This is a very fair question, and it's a, it's a good question. And uh, I have to say there is no absolute answer to this. Uh, what we need to understand is that every science system, every research system in every country has evolved with defined structures. So in Japan, you have players. These players are not identical with players, for example, in Germany or the UK or United States. So it's very hard to compare sometimes these systems with each other. What we should also know and understand is that most Japanese universities 
do have a educational task. Mm -hmm. So if you have to teach large numbers of students, obviously you cannot focus entirely on the research side. So it's a, it's a double um, um, uh, task that you have doing education and research. And I'm not talking about education of PhD students who are educated through research. I'm talking about the undergrads. I'm talking about teaching people for the first four years. This, you have large numbers and you have literally a, you have to give each of them a basis for future uh, uh, studies. So having said this, um, every country, however, and I'm very much convinced of that, needs a specific funding regime and also institutions that allow elite research because it's the elite research that has the greatest impact. And if I look at uh, the um, numbers uh, uh, that have been, uh, you know, uh, translated this research into products or patents, it's very interesting. Uh, they, they are only the highest cited papers, in other words, papers that are read by most have also yielded a uh, impact in patents. If you analyze uh, over a 10 year pe pe uh, period, all patents in the United States, you will realize that 75% of the uh, uh, quotations in these patents comes from publicly funded research mm -hmm. and this these papers are the papers that are in the top 10% or 5% of the highest cited uh, work that, they, that has been published. Yes, um, I, I don't wanna uh, talk too much about uh, Japan's downsides, but um, when you talk about highly uh, cited papers, 10, um, top 10% of cited papers, um, Japan has um, um, slided, um, over the years, and um, in uh, the latest um, report by the Japan's National Institute of Science and Technology Policy, um, when it comes to producing highly cited scientific papers, um, Japan fell to 12th uh, in the 2018 to 2020 period. And that's a record low for this country, um, down from sixth place ten, uh, a decade ago, one decade ago and uh, from fourth um, two decades ago. And um, as for the top spots, um, China came in first, uh, followed by uh, the US, uh, Britain, Germany, Italy, Australia, India, and Canada. And um, critics about Japan's standing have cited a number of factors, not just like the funding cuts, which is a very big factor, uh, over the years, but also the lack of um, um, independence, financial and creative independence, which translates to what you're talking about, high trust funding, mm -hmm. but also um, kind of risk averse and consensus based university management that hampers speedy decision making. Right. And when you talk, think about like um, Japan standing, and if you have like a magic wand, <laughs> to change the institutions in Japan or elsewhere, um, what would you do? Well, um, I, I will not start with the money. I, I will start with the structure. I think the Japan university system is, uh, needs to be reformed. Mm. It needs to re be reformed uh, at the governance level to have a clear separation between let's say a board of governors exclusively having a function of supervision and uh, developing a strategy with the leadership of the university. Uh, the uh, management of the university has to have professionals in all kinds of areas, not retired 
two university professors. Uh, look, look at Heather. Heather is from Canada and she is our VP for CPR, communication and PR. Uh, we have people that we hired uh, from Vienna to be our finance uh, VP. And so what needs to be realized is if you run a modern uh, university that uh, is supposed to be competitive, you also have the entire framework that is uh, that allows that. So that's one thing. The second issue is, uh, I believe Japan also has quite a problem in promoting career development of young scientists. Um, the, 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 if, if, if I just look at uh, worldwide, uh, when, uh, at what age uh, did the scientists make a discovery that has later on led to the Nobel Prize? In, in all kinds of areas. In some areas it's younger, um, in other areas it's a little later. But let's just say most of this has been done uh, before the age of 40 or the beginning of the 40s. What that means is that the most creative times of many scientists is at a young age. So what you need to give them is a complete independency and adequate funding. The complete independency in a Japanese uh, department where you have the professor, associate professors, assistant professors is not common. Mm. Mostly it's the assistant to the professor, not an assistant professor that is independent. So mm. here we really need to change the thinking um, that, so that's the second thing. The, the next thing is, uh, if I look back at the reform of the German university system, uh, which had similar problems, we have to realize that at some point, in order uh, to prevent, uh, let's say, unjust promotions, um, we had a what's called a um, um, a um, uh, a in, and, and we, we made it impossible that within a given university, you can become full professor if you start as associate or, or assistant professor. You had to leave. Mm. Why is that good? Because you have a horizontal um, a movement uh, within a country. Uh, so Having said this, uh, despite the fact that Japan is a reasonably large country, the one thing Japan is not, it's not international in science. You need, well, Japan needs a quality control that is including foreign scientists that are top in their field. Very important. The quality control is important. So finally, what you need is you need a system that allows within the university to also establish uh, lighthouses in certain areas. And uh, I know that there are uh, very uh, good tools that the world has developed, even from funding agencies like Wellcome Trust or Howard Hughes or in Europe, uh, ERC. What they allow is to give the young scientists a starter grant or something equivalent and the um, uh, advanced scientist an advanced grant. With this, you have time to develop yourself, as I said, five, 10 years in order to then do this research, which I call is high trust. So Japan needs two things. It needs to reform itself, but it also needs more funding from the government. Japan is just funding a little more than half of the GDP than Germany. And now you cannot be surprised that uh, Japan has about 0.5% of the GDP. Germany has 1% of the GDP that comes from the government. 
And if I can, uh, you know, recommend uh, to anybody a good read, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a economist from uh, University College London, uh, Mariana Matsukato. She has published a book called The Entrepreneurial State. Entrepreneurial this book, State. This book clearly shows that breakthrough innovations mostly start within a university with public funding. Mm. So uh, that, that uh, completes the circle uh, for the Japanese uh, um, um, finance minister uh, and shows that uh, this is not a subsidy. This money is investment in order to get the products that Japan is lacking in the future. I see, thank you. Um, yeah, when you think about like the success of uh, OIST, I think OIST is very unique in Japan. Um, and one thing that is um, sets uh, OIST apart from other universities, apart from this like structure, um, is the diversity of its members. I think. And um, so I want to we want I want us to talk a little bit about diversity. Um, I understand that the 63% of faculty at OIST are uh, foreign nationals, international people. Um, whereas at national university in Japan, across the board, the ratio of foreign faculty was like about a 5% in 2020 and 2021, which is not even meeting a low target set by the government to double the ratio to 6.4% over 10 years by 2020. So it's 5% now. And it's not, uh, the goal is 6.4%. 6, 6 <laughs> mm. And um, also uh, gender equality is another big concern. Mm. Um, just to cite an example, at the University of Tokyo, which is uh, the nation's top research university, I mean, uh, one of the top universities in Japan, and what, one of the hardest to get into, uh, the ratio of undergraduate uh, female st students is around 20%, while the ratio for graduate students is about 28.5%. Uh, so um, what has OIST done? And what are the OIST uh, performance in terms of uh, promoting gender um, equality? And mm -hmm. what lessons can others learn from OIST? Mm -hmm. Well, you were addressing really two questions. One is it's the hiring of, uh, say, international, uh, because right. the sixty-three percent we are having are professors that are non-Japanese, and the reason why they are coming to OIST is very clear. We have, on the one side, high trust funding, and to me, this is a very major attraction uh, to most scientists uh, that want to uh, you know live their dream the dream of their their research that is formed in their head um, and uh, on the other hand we have 80 percent of our students that are non-japanese so uh, i come to this uh, but the bottom line is high trust funding competitive salary a structure that um, is transparent and that allows the, the people to believe that this uh, administrative structure supports their work. So um, now, uh, how can that be translated then uh, in, at the university level? Well, um, the one thing I can guarantee is that there will not be a larger fraction of professors unless you have a grant funding system like the European Union has established where you give them five-year terms for the assistant professor and maybe even longer terms for the advanced uh, scientists. Because why should I, coming from the United States, UK or Germany, why should I come into a country where I'm not familiar with the grant writing system with the grant system as such and write grants. I, I see no reason. Why should I do this? Mm -hmm. So it's not attractive simply for a scientist to come. So that's, that's, the, that's my take on uh, the internationalization of uh, the um, uh, professors. 
uh, but you, of course, went far beyond and also addressed the gender balance. Now, the gender balance is much more complex. And when I look at, uh, this is almost internationally like this, uh, and only Japan uh, doesn't really follow that. So let's, let's march up the ranks. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start with uh, grad students. Graduate students in general, uh, worldwide, you have, uh, depending on the field, but let's just average it so that you have between 40 and 40 some percent of female students. Physics is a little less, uh, biology is a little more. So bottom line is uh, you have quite a good representation of uh, female graduate students across the globe. Now, now comes the point. If like uh, in many universities in Japan, the graduate students are not supported by a stipend. If what happens in noise uh, quite, uh, I would say not infrequently, if grad students form a family, you have to have a supporting system. And the minimum that has to be delivered is a stipend. Uh, you need much more, uh, which is for the professors uh, equally important. Namely, you also need, if you want to build a family, you need adequate child support, ideally in the university. Whether it's a grad student, a researcher, an administrator, or a professor, if you come as a woman, uh, and you know that you can, uh, your, 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 your children are well taken care of by, in OIST we have a child development center, you feel very comfortable. You, fe you feel that you can look after your kids, you, you, you can actually even walk to the, to the child development center in a break if, it, if need be. Mm. So what I'm saying is, Life is more for many people than just the research. So you have to provide the adequate infrastructure. Uh, now, th there is another issue that we need to discuss. Uh, and that is, if I look at the numbers, so let's say 40 to 50% in the graduate, at graduate student level, 40 to 50% at postdoc level, and then we look at OIST and we have about 18% of faculty. Then you have to ask yourself, what is the reason for this? Well, one reason is that worldwide, uh, there is uh, the, 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 the proportion of women in faculty is much too low. So mm -hmm. what happens? and one has to analyze that is between the PhD and the postdoc, a lot of women decide to leave science. Mm. It, it, may be, uh, it may have a cultural uh, reason, uh, but it may also be that uh, the many roles that women uh, feel they have to play, namely mother and uh, researcher, uh, is too much. So they, they look for a job that is less demanding. And if you look at the, uh, the, the science, science as a profession, it is very clear that it takes quite some time before you can feel secure and land your first tenured job. Mm. So the first job that is unlimited as far as your contract is concerned. Be this as it may, um, we need to um, take a, a greater effort to bring in the women. Uh, and that's what we are currently doing by um, having an emphasis. And if, we, if you look at some of our advertisements, we actually we say something like, we prefer to hire female scientists. And then we advertise, we have child support system. We have uh, housing on campus. Uh, we have stipends for students. We have salaries uh, and a career development path for postdocs. So this as a package, I hope will also allow the uh, young professors, uh, female professors to come to Okinawa uh, and work at OIS. 
That's very interesting because I've seen many advertisements uh, at universities saying like we promote gender um, equality and we prefer uh, to, to hire women. Um, you know, we promote diversity in our hiring, but if it doesn't come with a package of support, right. like what you say, it's just like on paper, but not in practice. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's very convincing um, that uh, we need to have a package of support, uh, not just words. Um, also, um, I think um, I also want to talk about um, regional development. So um, I think Oysters um, lived up this promise of um, conducting internationally outstanding education and uh, research in science and technology, but OIST have, has another mission uh, spelled up uh, in the university's mission statement to contribute to the sustainable development of Okinawa. And Okinawa is a beautiful island. I've been there many times and enjoyed staying there every time. But despite decades of um, uh, subsidies from the government, um, uh, central government, Okinawa remains one of the most um, the poorest uh, prefectures in the nation has a very high uh, jobless rate, low per capita income. And I heard that 30% that of children there um, live in poverty. So what can OIS do um, as a science university uh, to address such issues? Mm -hmm. And how can it give back to the community? Well, this, I think, was probably one of the underlying, re the answer to this question was one of the underlying reasons uh, that OIST was founded, uh, because a visionary politician, Koji Omi, has seen that over many years, uh, the economy in uh, Okinawa has not improved compared to the rest of Japan. Hence, the GDP per capita is the lowest, as you pointed out rightfully, of all of Japan. Now, in order to understand this, you have to be aware, what are the economic contributors uh, or what are, the, um, what are the businesses that contribute to the GDP in Okinawa? Well, foremost, it's tourism, retail fishing, farming, construction. So these are all professions where the salary level is actually fairly low. And people have invested in, this, in these four or five areas over the last 50 years without actually changing the matter that would increase the income, the GDP per capita uh, for the Okinawans and hence raise the standard of living. So little by little, uh, it has now uh, uh, transcended uh, into the heads of the politicians that we need a revolution in Okinawa and it is from my point of view, very unlikely that you can convince a major industrial company to move a subsidiary to Okinawa. My personal conviction is you have to start a high-tech culture in Okinawa. Mm. These new startups are by definition high-tech and bring in high salaries for the people that uh, work in these companies. So now let's, let's uh, uh, get a little bit deeper into this matter. Uh, what, if you look around the world, uh, uh, you, what, what is a driver in very general terms, what is driving uh, high-tech what is driving IP? What is driving startups? Well, I think uniformly, you have a substantial 
world-class scientific environment as the intellectual driver. Uh, that must not be in all areas, but it is a, um, let's say, it is a system that allows the startup, which they all are by necessity small, to go back to the university, look if there are machines, apparatuses, if there are procedures that they could utilize, if there are people that can discuss matters at the intellectual level. Uh, so uh, this is what what it takes. You need an intellectual center. Now, what you then need is you need a technology transfer that is conducive uh, for people from, from two worlds. On the one side, it has to be attractive for scientists uh, that wish to translate an intellectual property into something more substantial. On the other side, it has to be attractive to the venture capital world because the venture capital world, they must see the value of ideas or concepts that come out of a university or are being attracted to come in order to then invest in these projects through a startup. So now what we are having is uh, we need a couple of uh, say prerequisites. We have a university which is uh, not big enough, uh, but OIST has been very successful bringing in entrepreneurs from all over the world. We actually have a total now of 47 startups generated. Mm. And uh, I would guess probably half of these startups were coming with the entrepreneurs from all over the world. Actually, one of the most successful startups uh, that uh, in Japan has been uh, uh, has been uh, realized uh, by Indians that came to OIST in order to get this done using our financial platform. Now, um, what that has led to is that uh, OIST uh, and particularly our tech transfer unit uh, was successful in generating 50 million US dollar between 40 and 50 million because the yen is going down. Um, so if you translate it into dollar, the 50 million are now probably worth uh, only 40 million US dollar. <laughs> But be this as it may, uh, the bottom line is that this is enough money to have another 50 to 100 startups. Mm. So OIST has the tools to finance startups from within OIST and finance startups that are coming because we have the funds and the intellectual environment. What is missing? is a proper innovation park, a proper environment close to OIS, where we have professional incubators, where we have the housing uh, for a number that eventually in 20 years or so uh, could be up to 30, uh, could be up to 3000 people. So 3,000 people, 3,000 people. This is what we have. Uh, that is what we have planned. So we have created a master plan and that master plan uh, will uh, or is projecting uh, in 20, 20, 25 years that we have an incubator and we have housing uh, that then would be uh, employing about uh, 3,000 people. Now, if we employ this number, it would uh, actually close the gap of the GDP between mainland Japan and uh, Okinawa by one third. Mm. So just one innovation park will lift the GDP up. So it tells you that we are on the right track. And I'm very happy to note that uh, the just re-elected governor uh, Tamaki has said that he wants to create an innovation hub at OIST. So I will uh, remind him of that statement during the election campaign, because I believe that this is the route that could help Okinawan in the long run to increase the standard of living and 
raise the, uh, the, the, um, the salary level uh, for those that are connected with the uh, innovation part. Interesting. And also you believe in the idea of um, infusing curiosity in science among young people in Okinawa as well, right? Very much so. We have programs uh, and uh, these programs uh, have, uh, uh, have two components. We go out into schools, uh, grad students, uh, postdocs, and teach the children in high schools uh, and, and younger. Uh, but also we accept Okinawans to come to OIST and work as an intern alongside with graduate students in order to raise the consciousness of science as a profession. What is it? If you are like, uh, I don't know, 16, 17 years old, you have no idea what science is like as a profession. Uh, you also uh, can use the scientific platform uh, to form, let's say, your uh, um, future professional uh, perspectives. And I've seen people that uh, became a neuroscientist. I have another a girl from a Okinawan high school that now wants to become an MD working uh, 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 close in, uh, in research. So you know what I mean? It's all of a sudden these people uh, open for themselves a different world, a different perspective. And I think this is what OIST can deliver to Okinawa if we spread the word uh, like what we are doing tonight. Great. Thank you very much. Um, it's been very interesting and, and very inspiring. Um, now I'd like to open the floor to some questions if uh, anybody has them. And I, I, actually, I think we have received uh, several. Let me read um, some of you out to you one by one. Uh, first, I have um, a question from a viewer saying, asking, why did you come here to OIST originally? What intrigued you? And what really drew you to this work in Okinawa? Uh, it is a beautiful spot, but I imagine it is hard work. How would you respond? The, the, the reason is very simple. I have been, as you said in your introduction kindly, the president of Max Planck Society. And the Max Planck Society is one of the most successful research organizations. Now, having been, having worked as a scientist at Max Planck and having been the president, I have exp collected experience, what it takes to make an institution to be competitive and world-class. And when I uh, was uh, offered uh, the position uh, at the, uh, as a president and CEO of Okinawa of, of OIS, I came here and uh, it, uh, it took only a few minutes to see mm -hmm. what the atmosphere was like. Uh, as, as you said yourself, we are very international. So if you go in onto our campus and you see people from all over the world, you, you feel the spirit. You feel that this is something you can build on. Why can you build on? Because then the Japanese government provided an, a sufficient amount of high trust funding uh, in order to develop and to grow OIS. And I hope very much, and that was what attracted me, that the basic principles are were very much Max Planck-like, um, uh, except that we were a graduate university, which Max Planck isn't. Um, so we can give degrees, PhD degrees, uh, which is even a little better than what Max Planck can do. Mm -hmm. uh, but the bottom line is everything else, hire the best, let them work in peace, and then translate what is possible for translation. I think this uh, was quite attractive to me and that's why I came and I hope that the Japanese government will continue to increase the funding because this is necessary. Great. Um, thank you. I, I, we have another question. Um, so uh, I know you speak passionately on personalized medicine. 
could you please talk to us in broad terms about the importance and future of precision medicine? Right, I believe that the, I mean, this uh, buzzword personalized medicine will really change uh, the medicine of the future. I believe that our insight into how a cell, how an organ and how an organism works, uh, our insight of correlate genetic information uh, into uh, programs, uh, our insight into the programs that can direct, for example, organogenesis will allow us to really do precision medicine based on our individual uh, DNA that each one of us has. So uh, I see two areas here at least, uh, and one is uh, pre uh, the predictive ability. Predictive mm -hmm. ability means that by way of your DNA, uh, you also have a certain fate uh, because you may have a mutation. And you know, one of the uh, examples here it was Angelina Jolie, uh, who had a mutation that inevitably would have led to, to breast cancer. So she decided to have the breast removed in order to avoid getting cancer. So what, what I'm trying to point out here is that all of us have a different type of genome. And this genome also establishes to a certain extent, not 100% because some, uh, some traits are multi-gene, multi-genetic. So it needs uh, several genes that work together in concert. So that's why uh, uh, in some cases you need several genes to, uh, for example, uh, give you a certain eye color. Um, however, uh, you will have, and this is what I think will happen, each child, each child that is born will get an information for, the, for, for life, and we can uh, utilize this information to keep this child healthy as long as possible. And then also in terms of the second domain, uh, the um, directed repair, uh, we can already direct uh, uh, repair mutations, for example, in our blood, um, where we can change the sequence to, of a mutated gene to a normal gene. Um, we can have uh, a program that allows us to direct organogenesis in a tissue culture, in a Petri dish, that may deliver, uh, that may help us to deliver missing organs. So I think the medicine of the future will be a different medicine as the, to what we have today, primarily because we will see a shift from therapy to prediction and prevention. Great. Okay. Um, we have a comment from Stephanie, <laughs> I think. Um, do you think living, uh, Okinawa is famous, famous for its blue zones. I think we should learn from this part of Japan as in the science of longevity. Okinawans are known to have less cancers, for example. Do you think living in, in Okinawa has extended your life? <laughs> I think uh, this is a, it, it certainly has extended my life because it has driven me to do more sports by snorkeling and diving, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but it also may have extended my life by looking at what are the factors that contribute to a longer and healthy life. And this is a question I'm actually very interested in addressing as a scientist. So OIS is very much engaged in looking at uh, what factors determine healthy aging. Uh, we are looking at uh, um, analytical systems that allow us to have some correlations. We are looking at factors that can extend a healthy life. And I hope very much that we will get also a clinic here uh, that would allow us to then examine uh, the blue zone old people or elderly in order to get an idea in analytical terms uh, what makes 
these people different from people that die earlier. So uh, there's a whole package, and I think Okinawa is an ideal place to address these scientific questions. Great. <laughs> thank you. Um, we had a wonderful opportunity to talk today. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Gruss, um, for sitting welcome. down with me and sharing your uh, wonderful thoughts and ideas with us. Uh, and thank you all for uh, joining us um, from near and far. Um, oh. Before I close, um, I'd like to uh, introduce Maria Hellas Dijon, um, who will talk briefly about Sustainable Japan section of the Japan Times. Maria Hellas. Thank you so much, Otake-san and Dr. Grass for this amazing talk. It was very good and I learned a lot. As Otake-san said, my name is Maria Hellas Dijon, and I am the content director of the Sustainable Japan series at the Japan Times. Before closing the series, I would like to invite you to, if you want to learn more about Japan's efforts to meet the SDGs, please visit sustainable.japantimes.com, where you will find all sorts of interviews and stories showcasing what Japan is doing towards a more sustainable society. So make sure you either visit our site or Google search Sustainable Japan by the Japan Times. Great, thank you, Maria Angeles. And thank you, um, Dr. Gris again. Uh, for the wonderful You're session welcome. tonight thank you. <laughs> and thank you thank you. thank you everyone for tuning in tonight um and please uh don't forget uh to fill in the feedback for the summit program thank you again and good night thank you thank you everybody bye bye good night bye. from okinawa